Bring it on. Bring it on. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 4. We are in a new series. It's kind of a spinoff of the other series that we've been in. We've been talking about victory. And uh, we're going to go on to talk about heroes who overcome the world by faith. We can overcome the world by our faith in God. Now, in the original television series, Superman, you've got to be pretty old to see and remember that. But in that original television series Superman, uh, of Superman, our favorite superhero would confidently posture himself with his hands on his hips, you know, his chest all stuck out as they would shoot bullets at him. And of course, the bullets would just all bounce off of him and everything. And he would stand there with a smile with absolutely no thought of retreat at all. And then something absolutely amazing would happen. Once all the rounds were shot off, the guy would take the gun and throw it at Superman, and that same guy who stood there so valiantly, uh, you know, bouncing bullets off, would duck because he was afraid of the gun, all right? Uh, so how crazy is that? And what I want to say today is that if you live for Jesus Christ, your enemy is going to form weapons against you. Am I right? Your enemy is going to be shooting everything he has at you from the world. But if you have faith in Jesus, do I have anybody here who has faith in Jesus? You know who Jesus is. You believe he's the son of God. If that's who you are, you are going to overcome and you, and you can be confident of that. So if you feel that this morning, that you're going to overcome, just tell your neighbor, I'm not ducking. I'm not ducking, all right? No matter what the devil throws at you, you are not ducking. You're standing strong. You're standing firm. You've got your feet planted. You've got, you know what it's planted on? It's planted on the promises of the Word of God. You're not moving back. You're going forward in the name of Jesus. Amen. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. This is a victorious verse. If you feel like you're discouraged, memorize this verse. It says this, for whatever, the King James Version says, whatsoever, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he? that overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Is there anybody in the house who believes that Jesus is indeed the Son of God? Amen. And I want to let you know something about this verse. It tells us that victory is expected. If you believe in the Son of God, it is expected that your faith will overcome the world. If you've been born again, God has given you every single thing that you need for life and godliness. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And some would say, well, what is the world? Does that mean I overcome trees and birds and plants? No, the world is that system of the world. The world is a massive system that the Bible says is underneath the sway of the wicked one. Let me read that for you. First John 5 and verse 19 says this, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. All we need to do is walk around the world and look around, open up our eyes, and you will see the enemy's influence in the world. Yep. And the world can mask its satanic nature behind a smiling face offering pleasure and prosperity and power. But I want us to understand today that the world is not our friend, right? The world is not our friend, right? Those who are born of God, we are not, uh, we don't belong to this world anymore, right? Is there anybody here who says, my citizenship is in heaven? <laughs> I'm a member of heaven, hello? Uh, you know, is there anyone that says, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through here? There's the children of God in the house today. Because the scripture tells us while we 
we are in this world, we are not of this world. We're here for one reason only, and that's to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. This world is not our home, and if you're a believer in Jesus, you and I need to recognize the world for what it is, an enemy, a system that is energized by satanic forces and gratifying to the flesh. And that is why the scripture tells us that we've got to overcome the world. That's right. We've got to live above it. Walk upon it. We've got to overcome it. And so we've got to ask ourselves today, well, what does that look like? How do you do that? Good question, right? It's such a broad statement. You're going to overcome the world. I just can't wrap my head around that big, huge statement. And so I want to break it down over the next few weeks. And we know that we overcome through faith, but how does all of that work? And so I want to give you a powerful statement of faith today, uh, just kind of to begin, kind of like a foundational truth. And then here it is. Let me give it to you. We overcome the world by humbly coming to God on his terms on his terms in order to overcome the world first of all you've got to have a right relationship with God am I right you've got to have a real relationship with God that's the beginning that's the first step that's the foundation for faith and so we're going to be looking for the next uh, three or four or five weeks into the what I call heaven's hall of fame Hebrews chapter 11 and we're going to look at different individuals and how they overcame the world by faith and we're going to begin with a guy by the name of Abel all right Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number four are you still with me yeah. amen Hebrews 11 4 says by faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. Right. There are three things here that clearly states that Abel was able to do, all right? First, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain. Cain, you remember, brought fruits and vegetables, things that he grew from the ground, but Abel brought to God a, 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 a lamb. Uh, some animal that was sacrificed with the shedding of blood. Yeah. And because there was blood involved, because he was able to sacrifice that animal to the Lord, it was more excellent than Cain's offering that he brought. And because of that, the scripture tells us that he obtained witness from God himself that he was righteous, all right? Uh, how many of you know that you and I are only righteous because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ? Amen? I can't tell you that I'm righteous in and of myself because I'm not, all right? I am a sinner, hello? But let me tell you something. Because Christ imputed his righteousness to me, yeah. I am the righteousness of God yeah. in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And if you believe in Jesus, so are you. Yeah. Amen? So, and, and, and so God testified of his gifts, and the scripture says that he being dead still speaks. And so this morning, I'm really talking about a dead man's sermon, all right? A dead man's sermon, and if we were to put it down into just a few words, we would say this, that your righteousness comes from the blood. Your righteousness comes from the blood. Amen. But in order to fully understand uh, this story, we've got to go back to the book of Genesis. And let me explain to you who Abel was, all right? You know, we call Abraham the father of faith. But really, Abel was the first man of faith. That's right. He was the first man of faith. Abel was Adam and Eve's second son. They had a first son by the name of Cain. And how many of you realize that Adam and Eve were not really people of faith? They lived in the Garden of Eden in the beginning with God. They were in their innocence with God. They didn't need faith to be able to approach God. Right? God came down every day in the cool of the day. And, and how beautiful that must have been to experience the Shekinah glory of God and fellowship with God. And, but they didn't record, need faith in order to understand their relationship with God. And, of course, we kind of know how all that ended as well. Right? Adam and Eve chose to eat of the fruit God said not to eat of. And mankind fell. And ultimately, they were kicked out of the garden. And you might remember that as well that when they were in the garden 
Before the fall, they had no sense or no need of a covering. But immediately after they had sinned and disobeyed God, they felt need of a covering. Yeah. And so they gathered leaves of figs and they tried to cover themselves. But God, and this shows God's love. How many of you know that God is a God of love, Amen. right? Amen. Just wave at me if you believe he's Amen. a God of love. He God's a God of love because he, in his mercy, he showed them what they needed to do in order to have a covering. Fig leaves weren't good enough for them. And so and so what God did was he found an animal, he killed it. Blood was spilt onto the ground, right? And God made a garment for them, a tunic of skin. And, and they put that on for a covering, not just for their physical body, but with that covering that represented the blood of an animal, they were able to come before the Lord. Genesis 3.21 says, And also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. And this was really a very powerful, illustrated message to Adam and his, to his descendants. And God was saying to Adam and to all of us here today that man's ideas and man's way of dealing with sin is not enough. There's only God's way, and that is that blood has to be spilled. Amen. And that leads me to my first point today. First of all, God has showed mankind how to come to him. God showed all of mankind how to come to him. From the very beginning, God's heart has always been that men would come to him. That men would reconcile to him. Now you can see it in the way he treated Adam and Eve as he covered them and clothed them with these garments, right? Because his heart was toward Adam and Eve and he loved them, right? You can see it in this first family as we're going to continue to read here in the book of Genesis chapter 4. How they also approached God. Because we find here in Genesis 4, the sons of Adam and Eve, and they are both approaching God. Let's look at it here, Genesis chapter 4, verse 2 through 5. It says this, now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Now, if you just read that scripture without any understanding of the context of it, you would think that God was some kind of a cruel judge up there that really just preferred Abel and he didn't, didn't like Cain very much. And, and, but, but, but that is not the case. While we do not have a, a written record of God giving instructions on how to approach God and how to, to worship God, here are two brothers doing that exact thing that I'm talking about, right? They're coming to God to offer sacrifice. They're coming to a certain place at a certain time and bringing a sacrifice to the Lord, right? And so we can imply that God gave them this instruction. Am I right? There was a place where God was to be worshipped. You know, the scripture says they brought their sacrifices. They carried them along with them. They brought them. There, there was an obviously a specific place where they were to go to meet with God. And someone said, well, where would that have been? I really don't know. Some scholars believe that it could have been on the east side of Eden. Remember, the scripture says this. Genesis 3, 24 says, so he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so perhaps there, where Adam and Eve had their last conversation with God, God had set up an altar, and that was the place where they were to come, or perhaps it was some other place, but at least we know that there was a place, and I want to call it a mercy seat where they could come. And, and again, I think, I honestly, I believe it was right there where that guard, where, where that angel was, because, because the scripture tells us that there was also later on a mercy seat in Israel, and it also was protected by terror. Him. Hello? And so the divine presence must have been there. And so they obviously knew that if they were going to come before God, there was a place where they could meet with God. I wonder today, is there anybody that's glad we don't have to make a trek? We don't have to make a pilgrimage. We don't have to go somewhere to a certain temple, to a certain village, to a certain town, to a certain altar. Hello? We can meet with God whenever we need to. Come on. We can simply call upon his name before we ever get out of the bed in the morning we can meet 
with God. And our 